the cynicism of knowledge. Quoting Pontius Pilate, what is truth? Quoting Winston Churchill, you can trust a statistic only when you have manipulated it yourself. Quoting Blaise Pascal, Cleopatra's nose, had it been shorter, then the entire face of the earth would have been changed. Quoting Denis Diderot from Rameau's nephew, The main thing in life is simply to go freely, lightly, pleasantly, frequently, every evening to the commode. Oh, stercos pretiosum, that is the great result of life in all classes. Quoting Adorno's negative dialectics, All culture after Auschwitz, including the penetrating critique, is garbage. Diogenes is the real founder of the gay science. As such, he is not easy to classify. Should he be counted among the philosophers? Or is he similar to a researcher? Does he remind us of what we call a scientist? Or is he only a popularizer of knowledges that have been gained elsewhere? None of these labels quite fit. Diogenes' intelligence is nothing like that of professors, and whether it could be compared with that of artists, dramatists, and writers remains uncertain because, as with the Kinnocks in general, nothing of his own work has been handed down. Kinnical intelligence did not assert itself in writing, even if in the good old days of Athenian Kinnicism there was supposed to be all sorts of cheeky pamphlets and parodies from the quills of Kinnocks, as suggested by Laertius. To make use of intelligence in a cynical way, therefore, probably means to parody rather than propose a theory. It means to be able to find ready answers rather than to brood over insoluble deep questions. The first gay science is satirical intelligence, and thus it resembles literature more than systematized knowledge. Its insights disclose the questionable and ridiculous aspects of the grand, serious systems. Its intelligence is floating, playful, essayistic, not laid out on secure foundations and final principles. Diogenes inaugurates the gay science by treating serious sciences in a tongue-in-cheek manner. How much truth is contained in something can be best determined by making it thoroughly laughable and then watching to see how much joking around it can take. For truth is a matter that can stand mockery, that is freshened by any ironic gesture directed at it. Whatever cannot stand satire is false. To parody a theory and its proponents is to carry out the experiment of experiments with it. If, as Lenin says, the truth is concrete, then saying the truth must also assume concrete forms, which means on the one hand embodiment, and on the other radical dismantling. What was concrete will become even clearer once it has been put through the ringer. Thus, if we are looking for a label for the father of the gay science, the first pantomimic materialist, it could be the satyr capable of thinking. His main theoretical achievement consists in defending reality against the theorists' delusion that they have conceptualized it. Every truth requires a contribution from the side of the satyr and satire, of the mobile and mentally alert sense for reality, which is able to restore to the spirit its freedom in relation to its own product, and to sublate, aufheben, the known and the acquired, in true Hegelian fashion. Satire as procedure, to the extent that it is an art of intellectual opposition, it can be learned to a certain degree, when its fundamental gestures and turns of expression are investigated. In any case, it takes up as a position against whatever might loosely be called high thinking. Idealism, dogmatics, grand theory, Weltanschauung, sublimity, ultimate foundations and the show of order. All these forms of a master's sovereign subjugating theory magically attract cynical taunting. Here, the gay science finds its playing field. 
the Kinnock possesses an unerring instinct for those facts that do not fit into grand theories, systems. All the worse for the fact, all the worse for the theory. Mentally alert, it finds the reply and the counterexample to everything that has been too well thought out to be true. Whenever the ruling and master thinkers present their great visions, the cynical moles set to work. Indeed, perhaps what we in our scientific tradition called critique is nothing other than a satirical function that no longer understands itself. Namely, the realistic undermining from below of grand theoretical systems that are experienced as fortresses or prisons. See chapter 2. The satirical procedure, i.e., the actual methodological core of energy in critique, as Marx so aptly put it with regard to Hegel, consists in inverting things, in the realistic sense that means from the head onto the feet. But inversion in the other direction can sometimes also prove useful. A yoga for flat-headed realists. Inversion. How is it done? In ancient clinical satire, we discover the most important techniques that incidentally are related to the conceptual tools of the First Enlightenment, the sophists. As soon as high theory says order, satire opposes it with the concept of arbitrariness and gives examples. If grand theory tries to speak of laws, no more, critique answers by appealing to nature, physis. If the former say cosmos, then the satirists reply, cosmos may be there where we are not in the universe, but wherever we human beings turn up, it could be better to speak of chaos. The proponent of order sees the great whole. The Kinnock sees also the little dismembered pieces. Grand theory looks up towards the sublime. Satire sees also what is absurd. Elevated Weltanschauung wants to notice only what has been achieved. In kinicism, it is also possible to speak of what has been botched. Idealism sees only the true, the beautiful and the good, whereas satire takes the liberty of considering what is bent, crooked or lousy, also to be worth talking about. Where dogmatics postulate an unconditional duty towards truth, the gay science assumes from the start the right to lie. And where theory demands that the truth be presented in discursive forms, argumentatively self-contained texts, chains of sentences, the original critique knows of the possibilities of expressing the truth pantomimically and spontaneously. The latter also often recognises the best and grand insights, though the jokes can be made about them. <laughs> Through the jokes that can be made about them. When the guardians of morality perform a great tragedy because Oedipus has slept with his mother and then believe that therefore the world is no longer in order and the great law of the gods and humankind is in danger, then clinical satire first admonishes us to stay calm. Let us see whether that is really so bad. Who is really harmed by this copulation that goes against the regulations? Only the naive illusion of law. How could it be, however, if human beings do not have to serve the law? but the law had to serve human beings. Did Isocrates not teach that human beings are the measure of all things? Poor Oedipus, don't make such a long face. Remember that for the Persians and for dogs too, mounting members of the family is also very much in fashion. Chin up, you old motherfucker. Here in Greek antiquity, an epochal threshold in the cultural history of irony has been crossed. The sophist sages are so sure of being born by universal principles that they can raise themselves above any mere conventionality. Only an unconditionally culture-resistant individual can become free enough for such apparently vice-ridden liberties. Only where the social nomos has already done its work can the deeply civilised person appeal to physis and think of the relaxation of tension. The master thinkers let the theatre of the world, the display of order, the great law, pass review before their mind's eye and cast visions that probably also include pain and the negative, but that cause them no pain. An overview is achieved only by those who overlook a lot, quoting Galen. 
It is always the pain of others that the theoretical grand views of the cosmos call it for in payment. According to clinical custom, by contrast, those who suffer by themselves must also scream by themselves. We do not have to see out our life from a bird's eye view, or with the eyes of disinterested gods from another planet. Diogenes anti-philosophy always talks in such a way that we realise that here we see a person in his own skin, and he has no intention of leaving it. Whenever he is beaten up, Diogenes hangs a sign around his neck with the names of the culprits and walks through the city with it. That is enough theory, enough praxis, enough struggle and enough satire. The addition to, <clears throat> in addition to its quick-witted, mentally alert way of dealing with the official and linguistically coded cultural wares, theories, systems, Clinical anti-philosophy possesses three essential media by which intelligence can free itself from theory and discourse. Action, laughter and silence. Nothing is achieved by a mere juxtaposition of theory and praxis. When Marx claims in his famous 11th thesis on Feuerbach that philosophers had previously only interpreted the world in different ways, but that the point is to change it, through the world's becoming philosophical, philosophies becoming worldly, then, although born by a partially clinical impulse, he remains far below the level of an existential dialectical materialism. Diogenes the existentialist will not be able to stop laughing about the way in which Marx again throws himself into the business of grand theory. In the presence of so much rage to change, Diogenes would exhibit a demonstrative silence and, with anarchistic laughter, he would rebuff the impudent demand to make the whole of one's life a tool of a good old idealistically planned praxis. If we wanted to write a history of the clinical impulse in the field of knowledge, it would have to take the form of a philosophical history of satire, or better still, a phenomenology of the satirical mind as a phenomenology of combative consciousness and as a history of what has been thought in the arts, i.e. as a philosophical history of art. Such a history has not been written and would not be necessary if the principles could be made comprehensible without the historical crutch. In any form of erudition, intelligence risks its life. Those who deal with the past risk fading into the past themselves without having understood what they have lost in it. Those who heed these cautions will find sufficient material for a history of the gay science hidden in the archives or dispersed in the research literature. Rich traditions offer themselves for rediscovery, a great European Salentium tradition that, has, that was at home not only in the churches, monasteries and schools, but also in the unresearched popular intelligence that is concealed in the eternal silence of the majorities a silence in which there is also freedom, and not merely speechlessness, insight and simplicity, not mere dullness and oppression. There is an even greater European tradition of satire, in which the freedoms of art, the carnival and criticism combined into a many-tongued culture of laughter. Here the main strand of a militant intelligence is probably revealed, that bites like the clinical dogs without becoming doggedly pugnacious, and it strikes more into its opponent's consciousness with its mockery, irony, inversions and jokes than at the opponent himself. And finally there is an impressive tradition of action in which can be studied the ways in which people have taken their own insights seriously for the sake of a life whose chances they did not want to waste. That it was frequently an act of resistance is in the nature of things here. The art of the possible is not only what statesmen are supposed to master, but always comes into play where people try, with awareness and intelligence, to protect the chance of their life. My favourite examples of such action, apart from some pieces of bravado of the type found in Eulenspiegel, Schweig, and some manifestations of revolutionary praxis, are provided by those immigrants who, especially in the 19th century, set out from a hopelessly hidebound Europe to try their luck in the new world as freer people. In setting out this way, there is something of the clinical force of vital intelligence and of the exodus of consciousness into the open world, where life still has a chance to be stronger than the suffocating powers of tradition, society and conventions. If 
I were to say which individual action I hold to characterize an intelligence that not only knows but also acts, I would probably choose Heinrich Heine's emigration to Paris in 1831, this apex of conscious praxis in which a poet subjected his biography to the necessities and chances of the historical moment and left his homeland in order to be able to do what he believed he had to for his own sake and that of his homeland. Quote, I went because I had to, end quote. And behind this had to, there were not yet the police, as in the case of Marx and other refugees, but rather the insight that in a conscious life there are moments when we first have to do what we want, in order then also, in order then also to want to do what we have to do. The satirical, polemical, aesthetic dimension in the history of knowledge becomes important because, in fact, it is the dialectic en marche. With it, the principles of embodiment and resistance penetrate the course of socially organised thinking, the inexpressible individual element. Single persons intuitively in touch with their existence, the non-identical conjured up by Adorno. The thing there that is already mistreated by any mere conceptual designation because it is because it stimulates understanding and only makes a case of X out of the singular. Where should this individual reality assure itself better of its existence, apart from the arts, than in satire, in the ironic dissolution of imposed orders, in playing with what pretends to be law? in brief in the embodiment of this highly non-serious matter that, after all, the living being is. Dialectical thinkers, whether philosophers, poets or musicians, are those in whom polemics and the fierce and unconscionable animosity between thoughts and motives already form the inner workings of their thinking processes. Their presence of mind suffices, if one can put it this way, for more than one thought. All great dialectical thinkers and artists thus carry within themselves a disputatious, forward-driving and creative kinnock, or cynic, that from within prescribes movement and provocation for their thinking. Dialecticians are the movers of thought, who cannot do otherwise than to give the antithesis to every thesis its due. We observe in them a partly combatively unsettled, partly epically measured form of discourse that stems from a feeling for the figural, melodic and thematic in the composition of thought. In the disguised poet, Plato no differently than in the philosophizing musician Adorno. In the grotesque and pompous dialectic of Rabelais, as in the uninhabited, streaming rhetoric of Ernst Bloch. It would be worth the effort sometimes to portray the inner, cynical, cynical partner of the important masters, whether it be with Diderot or Goethe, Hegel, Kierkegaard or Marx, with Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, Freud or Foucault, and what really happens when Sartre, the master dialectician of the 20th century, confronts Flaubert, the grand cynic of the 19th century, on the thousands of pages of The Idiot of the Family, a confrontation so full of philosophical and psychodynamic morsels that it is obviously impossible to talk about it in an incidental manner. As we have said, kinesism cannot be a theory, and cannot have its own theory. Cognitive kinesism is a form of dealing with knowledge, a form of relativization, ironic treatment, application, and sublation. It is the answer of the will to live, to that which it has suffered at the hands of theories and ideologies, partly a spiritual art of survival, partly intellectual resistance, partly satire, partly critique. Quote unquote, critical theory tries to protect life from the false abstractness and violence of positive theories. In this sense, the Frankfurt critical theory too inherited the clinical portions of those grand theories the 19th century handed down to the 20th, of left Hegelianism with its existentialist and anthropological as well as its historical and sociological aspects, and of Marxism, as well as of critical psychology, which became well known especially in the form of psychoanalysis. These are all, if properly understood, 
theories that contain within them the clinical form of treating theory, namely the sublation of theory, and that can be made into fixed systems only at the cost of an intellectual regression. Such regressions have happened on a grand scale, and how much stupefaction has been perpetrated in the late 19th century and the whole of the 20th by vulgar Hegelianism, vulgar Marxism, vulgar psychology, vulgar existentialism and vulgar Nietzscheanism is all too crassly shown in recent social history. All these systems of stupefaction have dispatched the reflective agility of critical theories, established rigid dogmas as knowledge and left nothing of clinical sublation except arrogant presumption. In fact, the clinical sublation of theory stems from a conscious not-knowing, not from a knowing better. It releases us to a new and fresh not-knowing, instead of letting us become rigid in certainties. For with convictions, only the desert grows. Against this, Frankfurt critical theory achieved a great deal by attempting again and again to de-stupefy the theoretical inheritance of the 19th century and above all by trying to save the elements of truth in Marxism from its degeneration in Leninist, and still more, in Stalinist dogmatics. In its good times, Marxism was really a vehicle of an act of intelligence, and it knew how to fertilise all human sciences with its historical critical consciousness. The materialist conception of history has always contained hundreds of possibilities for another history, than for a history of the other. A real history of the other, however, can be written only by those who are the other, and the others, and have decided to let the otherness live, and to fight for the freedom to be allowed to be so. The most significant examples today are the history of femaleness, and the history of homosexuality. With the relating of their suppression and formation, both come simultaneously to the consciousness of a freedom that is now becoming real. By talking about themselves, In history and in the present, women and homosexuals also celebrate the beginning of a new era that they will be, quote-unquote, a part of in a different way than they were previously. History must be like this. It must proceed from something and lead to something that lives now and that lays claim to more and more life and rights to life for the now and later. What is passé on a vital level cannot be considered passable on a level of living knowledge. The historical is reduced to what has been finished, and what was only past but is not yet over. The unfinished, the imperfect, the inherited evil, the historical hangover. Whenever people and groups set about to finish for themselves such an inherited chapter of the unfinished, then memory and history will become useful forces for them, whether in the individual realm, as in psychotherapy, or in the collective realm, as in struggles for liberation. This distinguishes an existential historiography from the kind Nietzsche justifiably called musal history, a history that serves as distraction and decoration rather than as concentration and vitalization. We can call existential historiography cynical and musal decorative historiography cynical. The former tells of all we have come through battered but not broken, just as the Jewish view of history grew out of the insight into the transitoriness of foreign empires and into its own persistent continuous continuance. In the same way Marxism, in its good times, created a possibility of systematically narrating the history of oppressions, whether this was called slavery as in antiquity, serfdom as in the Middle Ages, which e.g. in Russia lasted until 1861, or proletarian existence, as in the present. But the language in which the history of oppression and the name of Marxist ideology will be told one day remains open. In any case, certainly no longer in the language of Marxism, perhaps in that of a critique of cynical reason, perhaps in a feminist language, perhaps in a meta-economic, ecological language. Cynical historiography, by contrast, sees in all worldly things only a hopeless cycle. In a life of the peoples, as in the life of individuals, in human life as in organic life in general, it sees a growing, flourishing, withering and dying. Spring, summer, autumn and winter. 
There is nothing new under the sun, is its motto, and even this is nothing new. Or it sees in history a victory route on which we have marched and will continue to march over the bodies of those who are silly enough to believe they could stand in the way of our will to power, our thousand-year Reich, our historical mission. Besides critical history, critical psychology is the second of the human sciences with its clinically effective barb. Today, with the progressive psychologizing of society, that is no longer so readily understandable, because for us, the clinical shock of psychological enlightenment already lies in the dim past. At best, we became somewhat aware of the offensive side of psychoanalysis in the Freudo-Marxist spectacles of May 1968 insofar as we were willing to see anything in psychoanalysis other than a great self-mystification of bourgeois society that oppresses, distorts and manipulates individuals and family and finally says to them when, as a result, they don't feel well, your unconscious is to blame. Only the Freudian left has transmitted something of the original clinical bit of psychoanalytic enlightenment in that, from Wilhelm Reich to Alice Miller, it knew at the same time how to avoid the pitfalls of analytic orthodoxy. In chapter 6, the final section, we indicated how the explosive power of psychoanalysis is initially connected with the fact that Freud equates the unconscious with the domain of sexual secrets. Psychological curiosity was thereby channeled in an extremely successful way towards what has always interested people most of all anyway. As the unconscious, it was on the whole neutralised and excused, and as sexuality, it was, on top of everything else, the most fascinating thing around. Under the spanner, the cognitive kinesism of psychoanalysis could breach social unconsciousness. Excuse me. Under the spanner, the cognitive kinesism of psychoanalysis could breach social consciousness. At first through a small opening, but later there was scarcely anything left of the wall. Then it came out, Everything you always wanted to know about sex. Kinnocks could not possibly fulfil their task more elegantly than Freud did. In immaculate prose and dressed in the best English tweed, the old master of analysis managed, while maintaining the highest respect, to talk about almost everything that one does not talk about. That in itself is already an Eulenspiegel action without parallel in the history of culture and it could probably succeed only because Freud personally did not underline the subversive, satirical and rebellious side of his undertaking, but on the contrary did his utmost to give his work the appearance of science. The miracle of psychoanalysis is how it so respectedly, respectably conjures all its objects, the oral, anal and genital. It is as if in refined society someone burped at the dinner table and nobody found anything exceptional in it. Freud managed what would leave even Diogenes green with envy. He erected a theory that makes us all, whether we like it or not, into cynics, if not even into cynics. It happens this way. In the beginning, everyone is a pure, natural being, born from the mother's body into a well-bred society, not knowing what is proper. We grow up as sexually polyvalent, polymorphously perverse subjects, and kinesism is universally disseminated in our nurseries, which at first, in everything, lives, thinks, wishes and acts completely out of our own bodies. Freud imported a clinical phase into the life history of everyone, and also found rudimentary explanations for why adults still tell cynical jokes, or are even inclined to make cynicism their attitude towards life. In every one of us there was once a primitive dog, and a primitive swine, beside which Diogenes is a pale imitation, but we, as well-behaved people, cannot for the life of us remember anything about it. It is not enough that this human primitive animal, as the educators say, defecates, and performs in front of everybody what we adults do there, where only our conscience looks on. Not only does it piss in its diapers and against the wall, this being at times even develops an interest unworthy of a human being in its own excrement, and does not even shrink from smearing the wall with it. That Diogenes did such things, not even his enemies claimed. In all superfluity, 
This being likes to frequently hold those parts of the body for which adults only know the Latin names, and shows in everything a reckless self-conceit, as if it personally, and in no one else, were the centre of its world. That this cynical, primitive animal in the end even wants to kill its father and marry its mother, or conversely, that after all that has happened is registered somewhat with resignation. Indeed, even when analysts maintain that the Oedipus complex is the universal law of psychic development in human beings, this is accepted like one more piece of bad news among many others. Later, it is noticed that Freud is interested only in the tragic versions of the Oedipus myth, not in the cynical de-dramatisation of the story. After these psychoanalytic revelations, parenthood must unavoidably turn into a battle between philosophical schools. For we have to become a Stoic when we have the kinnock physically right in our own house. If a connection between Freud's ethics and those of Epicure has often been noticed, that is because the Epicurean line was the most successful in finding a compromise between Stoicism and Kinnicism between moral duty and self-realisation, between the reality principle and the pleasure principle, between culture and those who experience discontent in it. Societies in the world era of states send their members continually on those two long marches from which the living try to deviate by allowing themselves shortcuts. With respect to our infantile side, we have thus all arisen from kinicism. In this point, psychoanalysis does not allow us any evasion. However, it itself becomes evasive by taking a thoroughly ambivalent stance towards the tension between the infantile and the adult. For it always knows how to arrange things so that the analyst remains respectable, while the patient child remains bestial. He makes a protege, so to speak, out of the clinical animal side in us, to the extent that we all possess such an analysable underground. Analysts are those citizens who interpret and counsel the still effective infantile, animal, neurotic, etc. uncitizenness of others. However, here it seems to be their greatest fear that they themselves will get caught in the undertow of their themes and be seen as just as disreputable as the oral, anal, genital phenomena of life with which they concern themselves. Perhaps, at least in part, the excessive interest in culture that is noticeable in many psychologists comes from this circumstance. They seem pressured to constantly prove anew their ability to be cultured, after having already compromised themselves enough through their professional occupation with the infantile and animal aspects of human beings. Psychological literature has become in the meantime a phenomenon of such dimensions that it can only be dealt with sociologically and statistically. Its primary concern is the self-assurance of modern semi-cynics in their cultural role. With cultivation, with books, diplomas, titles, supplementary training and degrees, they try to preserve their rights to citizenship in quote-unquote official culture which, by the way, in any case does not exist. At the same time, this serves the pedantic demarcation of sicknesses. There are more than a few psychologists in whose voices a lot of fear, contempt, superciliousness and aggression can be heard when they use words like narcissism, schizophrenia, paranoia, ambivalence, neurosis, psychosis. They are words of demarcation, words for others, words on the high horse of normality. It may however be a good sign that today some, I want to say insightful therapists, have decided to let the mask of respectability drop and to give up the role of the respectable portrayer of reality. They have, to their own advantage and that of their patients, come over to the side of the living. For those who have been made ill by reality, the path to becoming able to get through life well certainly does not lead by way of an accommodation to the Freudian medium misery of the average adult. In the domain of knowledge and the sciences, a number of cynical phenomena have appeared that constitute a counterpart to what, in the pre preceding section on religious cynicism, I have designated after Sartre, bad faith, mauvais foi. 
These phenomena are the crooked attitudes towards truth and knowledge that make these highest goods into mere useful items, or even into instruments for lying. Despite all apparent lack of respect, the Kinnock assumes a basically serious and upright attitude towards truth, and maintains a thoroughly solemn relation, satirically disguised, to it. With the cynic, this relation has given way to a thorough flabbiness and agnosticism, denial of knowledge. What is truth? asked Pontius Pilate when he sensed that he was just about to commit a crime against him. The most harmless among the cynicisms of knowledge is that of the examinees, who build up the most external and contemptuous relation to that which they have to learn, a relation of mere cramming, of rote learning, with the firm intention of forgetting it again after the examination. After that, already less harmless, follow the cynicism of the pragmatists and politicians who admittedly like to see that the next generation has acquired its academic foundations, but for the rest proceed with the attitude that theory is theory, and that in practice everything looks quite different. Here, all the learning and studying that precede function, like pure detour and selection mechanisms, rough according to the assumption that whoever gets through them successfully can also succeed with the other. Even though, as is generally known, study and subsequent occupation often are totally unconnected. Learning is separated cynically and instrumentally from its aims, and treated as a mere abstract certificate of qualifications. In some cases, the only thing that links study and occupation is salary, which is set according to the type of highest educational qualification achieved. The substance is degraded with cynical realism to a mere prelude, to academic chit-chat. How much ethos decimation and demoralisation continually take place here is scarcely measurable. One only has to think of courses that have to do with values, education and so on. Teacher training, the legal professions, publishing, social work, medicine. If Mephistopheles could say to Faust that all theory is grey and green is the golden tree of life, this evidence is an optimism that can be developed only by someone who has never passed from study into professional life. For here it becomes clear that theory was probably too rosy and that reality first teaches us what grey really is. But here we are not completely without hope. Course reforms work towards ensuring that the studies too will be just as grey as the prospects to be had after them. The actual and innermost connection between the sciences and cynicism, however, concerns the structure and the procedure of modern empirical sciences per se. For just as there is a form of cynical correctness in the relations between hostile individuals, there is also a form of cynical objectivity and methodological strictness in some sciences and some scientists' way of treating the facts. I believe this constitutes the core of what, since the late 19th century, we call positivism. If this word sounds critical, it is surely not because it designates a scientific mentality that stresses being logically exact and true to the facts, and refraining from any sort of speculation. In this sense, positivism would have to be a title of honour rather than a dubious label. But in fact the point of contention in the positivism debate is not scientific principles but the unprincipledness of science. For there are areas of research, and they are usually those in which the positivists do all the talking, where it does not suffice merely to behave scientifically, objectively, with the facts, but where more is demanded of the scientist than merely the capacity to collect data, produce statistics, and formulate theorems. There are objects in relation to which there is no scientific neutrality, but only partial and interest-directed forms of investigation. Most clearly of all in the entire domain of the human and social sciences, this way of seeing things can be made plausible even with respect to the natural sciences, see chapter 11, Transcendental Polemic, which indicates the connection between objectification and the process of making enemies. 
The dispute around positivism ignited not over its indisputable achievement in clarifying the logical form and the empirical basis of strict sciences, but over the naive assumption of the positivists that they could open up every arbitrary field of research with these means and thus subject every reality to the arbitrariness of a callous researching. The positivist, however, can be suspected not so much of naivete, but of cynicism, especially since the days of early and perhaps really naive positivism are gone. Those days are gone, and we have long since been confronted with a positivism in its third generation, which we can safely say has been washed in the seven seas. The short formula for the history of science in this century would have to read, The path of scientism leads from positivism to theoretical cynicism, functionalism. When critical theory pilloried the affirmative character of traditional and positivistic theories, it meant by this that such theories, in their artificial objectivity, betray a cynical assent to social relations that, to those who suffer, who sympathise, are concerned, stink to high heaven. In the methodological doctrines of positivism, and the new social functionalism, those theoreticians find their organon who, with detached brutality, indirectly and coolly defends existing systems against the individuals who come to grief in them.